Yes. Good morning, everyone. Good morning for all the audience in the Netherlands and good afternoon for the audience in Indonesia. Welcome to this session. It's about an inclusive approach towards smart, resilient and climate natural cities. Please allow me to introduce myself. I'm Rosalind Siburian and I'm the chair of the INP Indonesia and INP Indonesia is the organizer for this session. And INP Indonesia stands for Associations of Indonesian Intellectuals and Professionals located in the Netherlands. So we facilitate experts and knowledge sharing between Netherlands and Indonesia. So today, this morning, right now, we are glad to welcome great academicians and practitioners willing to share their knowledge in these sessions. I'm also welcoming uh, the members of the Indonesian Institute of Architects, EIE, who are attending the sessions. At the end of the sessions, I will give you the link to claim your uh, credit points for the membership. So we will start uh, with uh, the first speaker, and uh, we will divide into two, four presentations. The first one, uh, we will start with the introductions about smart cities. And the second one is about uh, the placemaking and go on with the best, best practices of placemaking overseas. And lastly, we will know what kind of tools that can support that activities. As the first speaker is Rizal Sebastian. And I would like uh, to welcome Rizal Sebastian to be on line on stage, yeah. Um, let me introduce him a little bit. Dr. Rizal Sebastian is a full professor of applied science. He is the chair of the research group of Future Urban System in the Hague University of Applied Sciences in the Netherlands. His expertise focuses on, on uh, smart cities based on knowledge of architecture civil engineering and ICT. Complementary with his academic role, he works as a senior advisor for the digitalization in sustainable built environment at RPO, an executive agency of the Dutch government. He has also served as a scientific expert in several EU innovation programs. So result, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, Rosalind. And special thanks to Nufik Neso Indonesia for hosting me here at your office in Jakarta. So I'm actually um, very happy to be here since I was born in Jakarta. So it's always nice to be back uh, in my hometown. Um, I received the scholarship from Nufik to study in the Netherlands. So I'm ha also happy to be back at Nufik. And uh, as a Dutch citizen, I'm also feel uh, very welcome at the Dutch embassy here in Jakarta. So. Um, I think I need your assistant to share the presentation. Thank you. So my uh, uh, talk for today, I'd like to discuss with you the topic about smart cities. And I hope our discussion will become a useful input and also inspire more discussion and collaboration between the Netherlands and Indonesia, especially uh, in relation to the development of the new capital city of Indonesia, the Nusantara. So before I continue, I think, check the system, can I? Yes, Rosalind has introduced myself, so I will not repeat it. Uh, at, uh, at the moment, I'm uh, uh, serving as a professor at the Hague University of Applied Sciences. And um, I also have experience working at global in engineering firm and also National Applied Research Institute in the Netherlands and uh, a private software company uh, for real estate. Next slide, please. Yes. Uh, in the coming 15 minutes or so, first I want to touch on the urgency and the policy context for smart cities, especially the sustainability in our built environment. Then I will discuss with you the aim and the challenges for the smart cities and uh, continuing with some examples and practical approach for applied research, which hopefully will lead to more collaboration between our two countries. Next slide. 
So the urgency and policy context. Yes, uh, as we all know, cities are very important. Uh, this is a global challenge, a global topic. And if you are familiar with the Sustainable Development Goals, and I'm sure after three days of this conference, everyone is familiar with this SDG, uh, you might notice that the SDG number 11 is about sustainable cities and communities. Next slide. Why uh, sustainable cities are important, why they matter? Uh, to start with, uh, in Indonesia, more than half of the population live in cities and the number is growing. In the Euro, in the EU, the number is even higher, uh, reaching 75% and still increasing. And uh, the living environments in cities in, around the world are facing difficult situations. Take this for example, this is a, a fact from the World Health Organization about the air quality in cities. And it mentioned like nine in 10 per people living in urban areas worldwide were breathing uh, dirty air. So this is just one of the challenges in cities. And if you consider the built environment, which you can understand that city is the melting pot of buildings, infrastructures, and urban uh, open spaces, public spaces, we will face more uh, challenges, especially in the sustainable transformation. Next slide, please. So in Europe, uh, we are uh, promoting this European Climate Act, which is translated into the European Green Deal. And with a focus on the built environment, this is a very important action since buildings are the single largest energy consumer in Europe. Our buildings use more than 40% of the energy and contribute to uh, more than 36% uh, of greenhouse gas emission. So that's why it's important to focus on our built environment if we want to reach the target for the climate and for the Green Deal. Next slide, please. Especially for cities, the focus will be uh, put on smart cities. And uh, since uh, this year, the European Commission has put cities on a high priority list uh, in the EU mission, especially uh, reaching the climate neutral and smart cities as one of the six EU missions. Uh, in the coming years before 2030, we want to achieve at least 100 uh, climate neutral and smart cities in the EU. And the Netherlands is participating with uh, seven cities, as you can see on the screen, Amsterdam, Rotterdam, The Hague, Groningen, Utrecht, Eindhoven, and Helmond, and other countries are participating with different cities as well. And if we zoom in into the Netherlands, next slide please. Uh, the government is committed to promote and even accelerate the sustainable transformation of the built environment. Uh, for, for you from the Netherlands, you might be familiar with this policy program, which is called Versnelling for Duurzaming Gebouwde Omgeving which aims to accelerate our sustainable transformation. Before 2030, uh, we are committed to reno renovate uh, one and a half million existing dwellings. And before 2050, seven million dwellings and one million of other buildings should be independent from natural gas. So we should rely on renewable energy in our built environment. Next slide, please. So uh, having this in mind, what are the main aim and the challenges of smart cities? Uh, most people would, would think of smart cities about ICT and digitalization. But I would say, before we think about ICT as enabler for the smart cities, we might think first about the real goal, the real objective of smart cities. First thing first, cities is about livability, it's about living environments. So it's about the people. So smart cities should actually optimize the livability for the people. And secondly, the climate neutrality. So we are talking about planet. And then the productivity. So it's about prosperity. So cities is a living organism. So uh, we have business activities, market activities in the city. And we are not only thinking about profit for uh, the commercial purposes, but uh, well-being of everyone. So on the right side, you might be familiar with these three P's of sustainability, people, planet, and prosperity. And uh, this is the main aim of smart cities. Next. 
a city is not a city without the people. So in the next presentation, we will listen about placemaking in cities. Uh, I want to emphasize placemaking in smart cities. Next, please. What is smart cities? The practical definition of it in relation to the three main aims of smart cities. You can think of, first of all, the abilities of smart cities to connect, uh, digitally connect the users, buildings, and infrastructures. And secondly, its ability to adapt to the changing users and the environmental needs. By doing this, uh, a smart city will be able to self-optimize itself to reach the optimal sustainable performance for the urban systems. Next. And the connection and adaptability of a city will, will facilitate the placemaking for the inhabitants. Next, please. I will illustrate some of the challenges uh, with uh, real examples. If we think about the livability, climate neutrality, and productivity of smart cities, you might think of these three challenges. Next. Uh, first, but energy transition. An energy transition in the city is not about individual buildings of individual users, but it should be done collectively. Next. And of course, the circular construction, especially if you think of the built environment. Next. And the climate resilience. In the next slides, you will be able to see some real issues and uh, real examples, especially focusing real challenges for applied research in what we call the twin transition, green and digital transformation of our urban environment. Next. To start with the challenge about energy transformation, energy transition. This is an example. This is a real neighborhood in The Hague uh, uh, where some colleagues of my university also live in. You know, uh, the neighborhood contains a number of households and uh, people who are really committed to environmental sustainability. Their motivation before they collectively uh, take the initiative to build and to run their neighborhood in a very sustainable way is the being a positive energy district. So actually, uh, this uh, environmental, this uh, sustainable motivation is behind their social bounding and they're behind the way of creating placemaking in the neighborhoods. The inhabitants took the initiative to establish an energy cooperative. Uh, which allows them to manage uh, the way they generate energy and also share energy with each other in their neighborhood. And this is one of the important factors, not only the built environment, but uh, this shared understanding and shared motivation help them to create social cohesion. And social activities take place in their common open space, which contribute to the placemaking. So I think that's a nice example uh, to be followed uh, in other locations and other cities as well. And if we talk about the climate change and climate change adaptations, we will be thinking about resilience for cities. You might be familiar with the IPCC, the United Nations Expert Panel for Climate Change, the Intergovernmental, Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. The Dutch uh, Meteorological Institute made analysis of the IPCC report and highlighted the challenges uh, for climate resilience in cities. Next. And, uh, you know, in, in, in Europe this year, we experienced the longest heat wave and drought of probably the last hundred years. Uh, probably is even worse than in tropical countries like in Indonesia. So when we think about resilience, we should think about the readiness the responsiveness and recovery ability of smart cities against heat stress and also against flash floods and local storms. These are the three climate change phenomena which are highlighted uh, for cities, especially in the midst of, um, of the IPCC report. And last but not least, I mentioned about circular construction. The Hague is part of the uh, EU project, what we call resourceful cities. You might imagine that 
our cities have already a lot of valuable materials, construction materials, but also other types of materials. Have you ever heard this term called urban mining? So when we do renovation, demolition projects and re new construction at the same time, instead of bringing in yet uh, other and new materials to the cities, probably we can make use of the existing materials, reuse, recycle, probably upcycle, and then we will be able to minimize our carbon and nitrogen footprint. Next, please. So in summary, it's about circular resource flows within the cities. It's about uh, encouraging bio-based construction materials. And altogether, we will reduce the carbon and nitrogen footprints. Next. And then digitalization, right? So smart cities are about this higher goal and digitalization is the key enabler. When we think about digitalization, we should think about applied digitalization in smart cities, which I think it knows three dimensions. The first dimension is about digital data. A lot of data is being co collected and being processed. Uh, and nowadays it's quite cheap to collect big data. The question is how to be able to manage this data in efficient information models. Uh, you from the construction industry might be familiar with BIM, Building Information Modeling, and GIS, a Geographic Information Systems, and the next step of BIM and GIS towards digital twins. And of course, using the power of data, uh, the artificial intelligence algorithms will help us to screen data, to validate that data, but also to use data for different uh, computation and calculations. The second dimension of applied digitalization for, for smart cities is about the digital tools. Think about immersive technologies, which is the next step after virtual reality, augmented reality, extended reality, and collaborative robotics, which we call the cobotics, both hardware and software-wise. And last but not least, is about transformation of digital processes. Don't forget that we need to standardize standardization about data, standardization about our applications, but also standardizations about the organizational processes at the government level, as well as at, uh, with the citizens. We can be successful in digital transformation if uh, the populations and the government are on the same level of digital maturity. So that's why organizations are also encouraged when they are taking part of smart cities to optimize their digital maturity growth. Right, so I'll come to the uh, last part of my presentation. Having seen the challenges, having uh, discussed the possible areas for research, how can we strengthen the collaboration between the Netherlands and Indonesia? Next slide. Probably to start with uh, uh, education and research from my university, I represent The Hague University of Applied Sciences. We have four campuses, two in The Hague, uh, one in Delft and one in Sutermeer, so all in the area of South Holland. Next. And our university is a part of the UNESCO Associated School. So we uh, follow and we are fully committed to the UNESCO values of diversity, of transparency and internationalization, of course. Next. At the moment, uh, we are a public university. We have 27,000 students, uh, more than 2,000 lecturers and researchers distributed into seven faculties and seven research centers. Uh, I'm uh, the chair of the research group Future Urban Systems, which is connected to the Faculty of Technology and also the Center of Expertise, what we call Mission Zero. I will come back to that uh, later on. Uh, we are supporting the education, especially in the curriculum for built environment. Next, uh, we have bachelor and uh, postgraduate uh, program in the built environment. Uh, the bachelor degrees are given for special planning, climate management, very important for smart cities, of course. Uh, the building technology and civil engineering, which is more the, uh, the technical brains of, uh, of the built environment. 
And we have a, a graduate education, the graduate course on BIM for professionals. Next. And when we do research, this is, I think, uh, I have a, a, a short uh, movie, uh, about one, uh, one minute. Uh, our approach for research is not theoretical at all, because we are uh, focusing on uh, practice uh, research, applied research, involving all the communities and the local governments. So I think in this uh, short movie, you will get an, an idea about how, uh, how we do research in what we call living labs which is organized within the knowledge center, our knowledge center, mission zero, so zero energy, zero resources. So we are very motivated for uh, sustainability. Uh, just, uh, just one preview, the, the movie is in Dutch. So for you in Indonesia, you can have a foretaste of the Dutch language. It has a subtitle in English, but I think uh, it will be fun to watch to all of us. And often probably you can help with the movie. Duurzame wereld. En dat kan bijvoorbeeld hier, een klein dorpje. Passerende trein! Dat vraagt om geluidsschermen. Heb je gelijk een mooie plek voor zoveel mogelijk zonnepanelen? Dus, techneut erbij, even sleutelen. Is de wereld weer een beetje beter, toch? Maar daar denken de omwonenden misschien anders over. De subtitle does not appear. Om dit op te lossen maken we er een living lab van, waar we samen onderzoek doen. Een onderzoeker en studenten van het kenniscentrum brengen iedereen bij elkaar. Uiteraard ook de omwonenden. Is er draagvlak? Ah, wat minder geluidsscherm en misschien doorzichtig. Maar dat beïnvloedt de oplossing van de techneut en ook de business case. Zo moet je samen tot een balans komen. Eerst testen en samen de balans vinden. Ja. Yes. So, uh... Yes, uh, it just, uh, uh, I'll skip that movie. I'll send you the link so you can watch it later on. And uh, just last slide, if you can share this, uh, the PowerPoint once again. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Sorry, uh, one last slide. Okay. I missed the, the final slide. Yes. Yes. Next slide, please. Yeah, and uh, just to close, there is an opportunity, and I'm aware of the NWO Marion Fund dedicated to Indonesia, uh, to the collaborative research. So if you have ideas for innovation, uh, you can contact me, you can share with us, and probably we can set up a proposal together. And of course, my former colleague from TNO will present innovation for development. I think we can uh, bring things together and also involving the Dutch organization who are active in Indonesia. Next. And thank you very much for your uh, attention. Uh, Rosalind, back to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Rizal, for uh, extensive explanations about smart cities. Now, um, as uh, Rizal mentioned in his presentation, uh, that the role of, uh, that placemaking has a role in um, smart cities. And it says that a city is not a city without the people. So this is uh, the part, uh, the interesting part uh, begins. To get to know more about placemaking, we will continue to the second speaker and that is Widyani. Yes, we welcome Dr. Widyani. Widyani is an assistant professor in the architectural design program at Institute of Technology Bandung. And the fun fact is, she was my lecturer back in the college days. Glad to have you here, Mbawidi. And Vidiani's research brings people and places together. In her current research, she is focusing at the physical environment and placemaking, as well as how people's daily routines and shopping habits change during COVID-19. Placemaking is a strategy and an activity for her. And as a response, two years ago, she began offering placemaking courses, not it, which feature community engagement as part of their curriculum. So, Bawidi, floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Rosalind. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would like to share my presentation. Okay, yes. So, uh, 
to continue what uh, Professor Sebastian mentioned about the need to have a sustainable city. And because we know that a city is nothing without people. So I would like to explain what placemaking is and why it is necessary for our better future cities. I would like to start with definition and then objectives and the importance of placemaking, key requirements for placemaking and the challenge. So let's start with this garbage. If you see this trash in the garden, I think you will undoubtedly clear it up, right? But will you, however, tidy up this trash if you find it in the park? Perhaps no. So using this as, this as an example, we can see that when a community or individuals who live there feel connected to the location where they live, they are more likely to be concerned about what's going on and they are likely to care more about the place. However, if they don't attach to the place, they won't assist either. With placemaking, we want to make people attach, connect with the place they live. And uh, placemaking may take place in any setting, such as public space or park, or it may occur also in a specific area, neighborhood, or even in a city. But as long as there is a social interaction that will create sense of place, place attachment, and sense of belonging between the individuals. Placemaking, according to several sources, is the process of building high quality environment where people desire to live, work, play, and study. Placemaking has a long history in urban studies and practices. I know that placemaking is not a new concept as Jane Jacobs explored in, in the 1960s, as did Herbert Gans or William White, who highlighted the significance of public space for livable cities and how people shape space into place. So, well, coming uh, a, a place that is well, feel welcome, safe, and walkable and it makes people having a strong of a, a strong sense of place will make people uh, and sometimes uh, where the place is lively unusual intriguing visual visually appealing sometimes with uh, public art or creative activities this how the major of people feel about their houses we think that once people or a group engage with the place, they will begin to form attachment to it. That's why we need to develop some strategies to increase involvement. So in order to do so, placemaking embraces many fields of endeavor from engineering, economics to sociology, art, and architecture. Placemaking cannot be done without the community's involvement, as we know that the placemaking approach relies heavily on community. Understanding who the users are in a scenario is important. And because each user may have own characters, culture, and behavior, its setting may have this a distinct placemaking strategy and solution. This is a picture of my students working together with children in Kampung to create their own playground. Placemaking place has a dynamic characteristic. We know that the community is changing. They evolve, come and go, and become older, as well as regulation and stakeholder relationship alter. A setting should constantly be responsive to the context and circumstances in order to be agile. It should include a vision for the communities. As a 
as an example here is a square in the in Bandung as is a public park but it is also permissible to worship at a particular times and this making characteristic is also bottom up with transdisciplinary expert to build community ownership through each phase of the process it's not only uh, yeah it's it's not only architects who who do it alone or to arrange alone but also require community that will utilize the facility to collaborate and why place making because we know that without human as their inhabitants cities are empty physical spaces human experiences is the essence of cities everywhere improving city is making the human experience better and future cities should be better and more livable places for the human experience so to establish to connect people to establish a sense of place through shared meaning and a sense of purpose is the aim of the placemaking to do a placemaking approach we can develop from a sense of place model which has a form as a physic activity and meaning a sense of place needs social interaction to create sense of belonging and uh, develop place attachment to do so we need to have participatory design action research transdisciplinary approaches and sustainable and it's not that it's it sounds easy but actually place making is less frequently practiced why because place making requires proper management for good places it's also involvement of social life community and sense of place in the beginning of the process so it cannot be done later on and it requires good rules for human scale the street human scale of design and it needs the standardization of construction work and it involves more than just focusing on economic outcomes it should be thinking of prosperity for everyone place making has play important roles on sdg the aim because the aim of place making is contributes to good health and well-being a good place will empowering gender equality and re reduce inequalities and with the vision to be sustainable place making play a role on sustainable cities and communities and the idea and visions of community can help industry innovation and infrastructure to develop the challenge of place making is a potential conceptual instrument for inclusive governments in the deliberative and participatory process of space management interestingly place making most common arrange at the strategic phase of the planning process but nowadays place making is still underrepresented in the design and implemented in implementation stages so what can we do we can start with the do place making by social interaction for example we start with participatory design involve communities include them in our design and for action research we can learn from emergent practices and trends what's going on in place making and with transdisciplinary approaches we can also uh, learn about to make a collaboration with among stakeholders government private sectors expert at the universities and also disseminate the place making concept in every disciplines therefore understanding better the place since every places has a unique characteristic and to make the place sustain in the future so 
uh, this is my last presentation and I would like to ask you to be one of the placemakers just by follow us at uh, placemaking.id at Instagram. This is uh, where our placemaking activity at the university are placed uh, and informed and you perhaps you can also follow and join our activities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt Widi, for a great presentation. And now we are moving forward to our third uh, speaker, and it is um, Lisa Van Rijn. But anyway, we flashback a little bit to what Samba Widiani has explained here. Yeah. She has introduced us to the concept of a placemaking as well as the necessity of a placemaking as the main show, let's say, of a city. There are, of course, some challenges. Therefore, let us uh, hear the placemaking best practices from the Netherlands and perhaps some other European cities. And it is our third speaker, Lisette van Rijn. I will shortly introduce Lisa Van Rijn. She is a senior advisor at Stipo uh, from 2000, uh, from last year. And she graduated as a construction project manager from a South Bank University, London in uh, 2002. In Hong Kong, she worked for urban discovery on the, on the relevance of architectural heritage for livable, livability in Asian cities. Together with Lisette Stiepel created the City at Eye Level Asia book. In the Netherlands, she focuses on urban livability, sustainability, and co-creation. Lisette aims to bridge the gap between technique and human scale, between project themes and community. Topics which interest Lisette are energy transition, good and inclusive growth and societal impact. So Lisat, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Rosalind, for this kind introduction. And thank you for NAFIC and uh, the Embassy of the Netherlands to, uh, to invite me as a speaker. And thank you to IMP. Um, I'm very, very happy to be here. Uh, let me share my uh, slides. <clears throat> So um, yeah, I have uh, uh, had a, a kind introduction already. Uh, I work for Stipo. Stipo is an Amsterdam-based small company. Uh, we work on human skill cities at the city at eye level. Um, we have actually global reach because we are a network organization. And uh, within placemaking, we work a lot uh, with Placemaking Europe, one of the network organizations in Europe that we helped help to kickstart. And also Placemaking X, which is a global uh, organization which uh, stimulates placemaking in, uh, uh, throughout the world. Um, as... Um, uh, Rosalind said, I'm uh, uh, yeah, one of the initiators of the book City at Eye Level Asia, which basically aims to uh, really um, uh, help to uh, 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 make a network of people like all of you, like-minded people that have an interest to have a nice human skill city also in Asia. Um, I'll come back to that later. Um, let me check my second slide. I'm uh, one of the the last encounters that I had was in Indonesia and actually in Kota Tua and uh, Jakarta was in 2014, um, uh, already a long, long time ago. But this was at a beautiful, beautiful placemaking um, uh, initiative, the Creative Arts Festival in uh, Kota Tua, and I'm super happy to maybe a little bit uh, contribute to uh, longer collaborations and more collaborations within placemaking uh, with, uh, between Indonesia and, uh, and the Netherlands. So we heard already a little bit about, hey, uh, cities are, 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 are basically uh, nothing without the people. But more and more we see these kinds of, of, of pictures uh, uh, floating around. I'm, always amazed when when I'm at a urban development conference, we don't see any 
pictures of the actual people that make the city. It is more like this, right? Um, and we always say, you know, if you lead your city development, your urban development by design, this is what you get, a lot of design. Beautiful designed places, beautiful designed squares, but not so friendly to the human skill, not so warm, not so inviting. Beautifully designed um, playgrounds, hmm, maybe not so inviting for, for, for the actual children to explore and play uh, and make mistakes and learn. And yeah, same like if you design your, your community around cars and traffic, what is uh, what you get is more cars and traffic. So basically we say, um, if you have your hum human skill at heart, if they have the people of the city at heart um, during your community and design uh, process, this is what you get. More people, more uh, interaction, and more people feeling, feeling happy. And this is what we need in our cities. Uh, more interaction, inclusive, um, and people feeling free to uh, sit around and chat. So this is what we aim for at Stipo, but also with uh, our work in uh, placemaking. We aim for social quality, uh, we aim for community, and we aim for uh, uh, inclusion. And of course, this is a very uh, typical Dutch uh, example uh, of a stoop, a sidewalk, where which is actually a little bit reclaimed by the people that live there. <coughs> so this actually means if we we think back in time, and I'm very happy that uh, Dr. Widiani already shared the uh, the yeah Indonesian context of of, of place making, and there's lots of overlap in our thoughts and in our ideas, and actually grateful for that because. Uh, uh, yeah, now we get to meet and now we can continue to collaborate on these themes. But uh, as she mentioned, it's already a long, uh, long uh, ideas. Place making is not new. Um, uh, we base our thoughts on, on uh, Jane Jacobs, obviously, but also on Jan Gill in, in, in Denmark, who um, basically says, you know, when you think about cities, you first think about life. Then you think about spaces, and lastly, the buildings that will stimulate that life um, within the cities. So what does that mean in our context? I already mentioned quickly the city at eye level. So when we talk about space and life, it's not only the public space that we talk about, but it actually also includes the, 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 the ground layer, we call the plinth, of, of the buildings that surround that space. Because this is what we experience when we as humans, um, uh, users, residents, um, uh, we roam in a city. And this is where we, will, we want to feel at ease. So luckily there's a lots of uh, uh, research already uh, within uh, this, this, this area. Um, and this is something that we can focus our designs uh, from, but also in our inclusive and play, placemaking approach. We can uh, um, uh, we can use these 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 ideas. So um, people find it super pleasant to stay in in um, in public space when it's kind of like informal. It's not so designed. It's not so perfect. Um, it's kind of like incomplete, where people can still add something of their own. Uh, basically, it needs to be inclusive, right? Uh, everybody needs to be uh, welcome. Um, kind of like an innovation, but in, in, not in a sense of an innovation that, it, that, that should be super well uh, organized, but also innovation that it appeals to certain kinds of, of, of people. <clears throat> and this is basically uh, based also on research that is done already uh, decades ago by William White. Um, 
Yeah, what do we need? We need food. Well, especially in Indonesia, uh, this is, I think, a, a basic ingredient. Uh, we need places to sit. People should be okay in watching people, watching others. Uh, this is, a, a, I think, a basic human need, right? Um, sun, maybe more in, the, uh, in Western Europe. Shade, definitely in the areas in Indonesia and Southeast Asia. So placemaking, as already Dr. Widiani also said, it's not just about beautification. It's really about building a strong community and an inclusive community around the place so that people can, can um, uh, feel welcome. So how does placemaking differ from conventional planning and development? Well, it, in, a, in certain, uh, certain areas it does. And let me put on my glasses to help you, help me read. <laughs> um, basically, the planning authorities uh, and the real estate developers generally only cater for the basic human needs at the, at the bottom of the Maslow uh, pyramid. Um, this is what you you basically yeah need to have in a, in a in a proper public space: safety needs, psychological needs. Um, uh, but then again, to make something a place, um, people need to be feel kind of like a, a self-fulfillment. Um, it needs to cater for social interaction, as I said, create, uh, create creativity and meaning. And this is something that can be added by placemaking. Um, so it's super important, as Dr. Widiani also mentioned, to build a social uh, network within uh, the areas that you want to uh, uh, initiate placemaking. So you include the local community and not always the local community is willing to participate. So that this is where you find your local heroes, um, the local people with energy and they can then start to invite the, the rest of the community that you that you aim for. Um, and that will help to uh, the community to help co-create. And this is a long process, but it's a very important and a very uh, fulfilling process. Then as, you, as I mentioned, not only think of the public space, but think of the whole area and also the ground, uh, the ground floor of the buildings um, incorporate that to uh, to um, um, make sure it's not only the buildings or not only the public space, but the whole area. Because um, this is what we often see, right? Um, empty, cold areas where we quickly want to run. And I think even in uh, in uh, the bigger cities, the new developed cities in, in in Asia, this is this is something that we see very often. You know, this is what we need: places uh, where we can sit, where there is attraction to the eye, where we can linger, where we can feel at ease, where it's not so cold, where it's um, uh, uh, yeah, where we where we can feel comfortable. So when we talk about placemaking or good public space and the, the, the co-creation, we need to design our processes uh, differently. Uh, we incorporate creative uh, initiatives to really appeal to the community around, to make sure that they, hey, I, I, I can say something. I'm allowed to say something. Hey, I'm even allowed to co-design. I'm, I'm even allowed to, to cooperate. Um, I don't know. I notice a lot here working in the Netherlands that people are a little bit hesitant. The faith in the government is really low. The faith in, in local government is really low. They say, okay, yeah, we can think, but... Uh, probably um, the, uh, the organizations and the, the local authority will, will not uh, take me seriously and will not really use my, my thoughts and ideas. So pff, I'm not going to say anything. Mm -hmm. So there is a really a hesitant and a, um, yeah, people don't want to participate, which really is a pity because we, we start to understand that without the local ideas, 
yeah, everything is top down and it actually doesn't, doesn't really uh, work. So whereas traditional planning is top down, placemaking planning is really a continuous uh, circle. Um, um, and one of the things that is really helpful within placemaking, um, it's about being quicker and lighter and cheaper, which means that there's a lot of like a, a temporary design uh, interactions um, with temporary um, activities such as yoga. This is in a square in, in, in Rotterdam, right in the center, um, but also temporary places to sit where you can try out what works and what doesn't work. And this is in Milan, in uh, uh, where in the last three years they have uh, reclaimed uh, 40 squares um, from the cars to the public. So all these squares used to be uh, places where people would uh, park their car. And just by simply painting um, and putting some uh, temporary uh, furniture, people start to reclaim uh, these super important public spaces. And this is in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam, where one of our uh, colleagues, he said, okay, you know, let's completely rethink the use of public space. And he opened an open air hotel just for a few nights. Um, so I think what is super important is that placemaking is something for everybody. It's not just for the community. It's not just for the activists. It's basically also something that we all need to do as investors, as designers, as public authorities, uh, and lastly, of course, as the local community. Everybody should try to, 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 to act like, like, like uh, a user with a placemaking mindset. <clears throat> and like a city, it's never ever finished. So with investors, we call it more place-led development. Together with the designers, we call it more like place management and the local authorities and the, and the, the local community, um, uh, they, uh, uh, they call it more like uh, place-making activation. Um, just quickly, I know my time is running out. Um, uh, you can follow us uh, at Stipo, but basically I think the most interesting thing to learn more is to uh, to go to uh, the city at eye level Asia. This is a book that you can uh, download for free from our website, um, and uh, uh, it's a book that contains all kinds of theory, but most of all, all kinds of uh, best practices throughout Asia, um, and we are uh, open source, so you can download it here for free. Um, but actually, we are continuing to stimulate a, um, a city at eye level network and a placemaking network also in Asia. And we have quite a lot of contacts. So I really urge you to uh, connect to, uh, to uh, us or connect to the Facebook, Facebook group, uh, Placemaking Asia. Um, um, uh, and then I really hope to continue to work with you within this global uh, process on placemaking and making our cities better, our cities better for people. And I would like to um, uh, conclude with a question to all of you. Um, thinking about the new uh, capital, hey, this is a city that is yet to be developed. But how, how would you capture the spirit of that place? Thank you very much, Rosalind. And uh, I'm looking forward to your uh, uh, questions, uh, uh, people in the audience. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Uset, for your really eye-opening uh, presentations about the placemaking best practices, especially from um, the Netherlands. OK. And yeah, in her presentation, this that reminds us that uh, placemaking is an, an ongoing and circular process involving many stakeholders from uh, authorities, investors, designers, planners, activists, and of course, local community. It is a comprehensive collaboration. Therefore, we have decisions and we invite a lot of uh, stakeholders to, to, to listen to decisions. 
Okay, and then the last presenter will be about uh, digitalization. And I would like to invite Peter Paul van het Veen. Yeah, okay. So we are now living in the digit digital era, let's say, and applied digitalizations would greatly contribute in enabling uh, smart cities and in particular the place making uh, process. As Rizal mentioned previously in his presentation, it is digitalization, it is the key enabler. Therefore, now we will get to know the tools that uh, TNO has developed to support these processes. And uh, Peter Paul van der Veen will present that and uh, shortly I will introduce him. So Peter Paul van der Veen is a business developer at TNO. Uh, for the Innovation for Development, I4D program. He has more than 30 years of experience in applied research and innovations, among others in high-tech, construction, process, and maritime industry. He presently is, he presently is working on uh, different solutions aimed at circular economy, energy transition, and affordable housing in lower and middle-income countries. So, Peter Paul, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rosalie. Uh, oh, can I have my presentation here? Yeah. Okay. So, so, first of all, I would like to thank the organization of Winner for the opportunity to present uh, Tino's uh, urban strategy tooling. And after two excellent presentations on placemaking, I think we're now going to, you're going to see some some work that is more of course uh, related to urban design and more more top down but I'm, i feel there can be there can be made a connection clearly so uh, as we know uh, the pressure on the mobility uh, system in cities is uh, is very high so current trends uh, as growing and aging population lack of sufficient space and pressure on the urban environment lead to cities that struggle to stay accessible, become sustainable, and remain livable. At the same time, several transitions in mobility are in the way, so we call it new mobility. As further digitalization and use of data is foreseen, and the introduction of mobility as a service. Further automation will be introduced and lead to more connected and automated driving in the future. So presently in more and more cities, electrification rates are growing rapidly already. Uh, these trends and transitions have a profound effect on the city and create both opportunities and challenges. So new mobility has an enormous potential to, to uh, create much better conditions for livable, accessible and sustainable cities. However, poorly managed and introduced, new mobility may well lead to the opposite. So the shift from public to private transport and rapid development of winner-takes-all scenarios, even an exponential increase of traffic volume could be the case. So more congestion and pollution could occur and also there could be a, a an unbalance in the traffic mix in the end, leading to ill-designed uh, infrastructure. With the introduction of new mobility, there comes a high risk of prioritizing individual and commercial interests over public interests, so both financially, environmentally, and spatially. So at Tino, we have developed over the years the urban strategy tool. And I want to shortly introduce this tool to you. It is used in different cities worldwide to investigate and solve mobility and urban design issues. Urban strategy is a data-driven platform for urban planning and design. Focus is on urban mobility in relation to its environmental and spatial impact. Urban strategy makes use of cost-effective with high performance hardware, which makes it possible to compute scenarios in nearly real time. 
the Urban Strategy tool has a modular edge architecture. A central database with static data and one with dynamic real-time data are connected to a data bus for communication. A connection can be made to real-time data from traffic management systems or other sources. Different simulation models are available and for specific analysis, modules can be added too. So the, the simulations that are performed are multi-domain. A large number of modules for different parameters are already available. Simultaneous and combined analysis of mobility, environmental parameters, energy system, and safety is possible. And as said, even more parameters can be added depending on the question at hand. So the, the system, due to the high computational performance, can be used in real time and in an interactive way, so making it ideal for use in workshops and design sessions. The system can however also be used in real-time applications to guide decision-making. I want to show you some examples of applications of the Urban Strategy tool. So this is an example of uh, the application in Amsterdam. The tool is used by the municipality of Amsterdam to identify and design solutions for complex challenges such as redevelopment of existing districts, and maintenance and renovation of road infrastructure. The urban strategy tool closes here the learning cycle and is used to validate assumptions using real-time data, which enhances the quality of decision-making in the city of Amsterdam. The second example is from the city of Singapore. And this is really quite for forward-looking, so we're talking about uh, the, the deployment of a fleet of 6,000 electric buses in the year 2040. So here there's no, no data available. You have to develop the case uh, and, and generate data uh, based on, on assumptions and models. A specific model for electrification of public transport was developed and added. A multi-domain optimization study was performed using relevant information about the local situation the ambition of the city and regulations in the city itself. But also use, uh, included were the optim operational parameters for the public transport system. So the, the, the use of different technological solutions could be evaluated in order to come up with an optimal solution. And as we're talking about 2040, the system is still used by the, by the local authority to optimize their de design. And then the next example, this is an, an example from the, the island of Curaçao in the Caribbean. So here a digital twin was made for the combined public and private mobility system. And the transition uh, was to develop a, a roadmap. Here was the, 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 the effort was to make a roadmap for the transition towards an integral mobility system in which public and private providers of transport would supplement each other and costs for lower income groups would be reduced. So the digital twin is currently hosted by the University of Curaçao and further research is underway. And then towards, uh, because this I think is a very nice example of uh, inclusivity also, but here then we go to a, a greenfield approach. Here, then we talk about the city of Shenzhen in China. And here, the urban strategy tool was used to develop a completely new district. So here we have a greenfield development, 16,000 residences, 16 larger towers, and also, of course, uh, the, the question of, of uh, um, how, how, to, how this, in this, in this area, all functions could be included and what would be the effect on air quality and noise. So design question here was, to eat, was how to keep this area accessible and livable with regards to air quality and noise. And the results showed that, we, that using the tool, an optimal balance could be achieved. To wrap it up, the current trends in cities in combination with new mobility Solutions require multi domain analysis to safeguard accessibility, environment, and livability. Dino developed the urban strategy tool to assess, monitor, and evaluate system interventions with multiple stakeholders in an interactive way. 
The tool is used both for renovation as well as greenfield development. It's flexible and it can be extended. And as Dino, as Rizal already pointed out, we're looking for partners, academic or engineering companies, to develop in cooperation local applications. I want to thank you for your attention. Look forward to the questions. Back to you, Rosalyn. Yes, thank you very much, Peter Paul. So, Peter Paul will be the last presenter, and we will continue now to the question and answer sessions. So, I've received um, some questions, and I will address. And because of the limited time we have right now, and we will be exceeding the allowed time, but okay, hopefully, we still have time to answer one uh, question for each uh, uh, speaker. So, I have a question first to Lisa. So, Rizal, uh, maybe we can just put everyone, all the speakers, uh, on stage. Okay. So, Rizal, as I understood uh, the concept of placemaking, it is a bottom-up approach, or maybe circle, as Rizal also mentioned, and it's uh, community-driven. On the contrary, I understand that smart cities concept is more into a top-down approach. It's uh, more into traditional model. How do you think the authorities and planners of the new capital, Nusantara, should integrate uh, these two different approaches? Please. Well, thanks for the question. So top down and uh, bottom up, I think we should meet in the middle. It's very oh. Indonesian way, right? <laughs> well, uh, seriously, I think uh, the approach can only be successful if we work in quadruple helix. That means the government, the citizen, businesses, and also academia. So that's uh, the way we create an inclusive smart city. And I think this should be uh, taken into account in the integral planning for the, for the new uh, capital city. And I, I, I tried actually to show how this works in practice through this approach of living labs, but the movie didn't work out just now. So probably if we still have one minute in the end, I can try again to show you the movie. I can show it. Now. If you like, I can show it now. What do you think, Rosalind? Is it fine? Yes, uh, if it's shortly, like half a minute, it's okay then. Yeah. Feel free. We'll try, we'll try. Okay, uh, hang on there. Hang on, and now switch on, yes, I just share my screen and hopefully it works. Give me a sign, what do you think? Oh, no, no. Uh, think it's still in Dutch. <laughs> it's, it's still in Dutch. Sorry. So yeah, okay. uh, maybe yeah. we skip the movie part. Maybe you can explain more about it. Yeah, that's that's a good idea. So uh, the approach is every time we think of a new uh, innovative solution, uh, we start with a, a small scale experiment in the neighborhood. We involve the the local inhabitants and ask them to adopt the uh, the solutions and we deploy students to take interviews and to monitor the progress. And these inhabitants will then uh, communicate to their, um, their neighbors. And we also involve the, the local municipality, uh, staff from the local municipality to see if uh, this fulfills the, uh, the requirements from uh, a regulatory frame, frame, uh, framework. And then after two or three uh, rounds of, uh, of feedback, it's kind of iterative approach. Uh, together, we shape up the solutions even better. Uh, the example that uh, I wish to show you was about uh, a noise uh, barrier along uh, a train, uh, along a ra railway passing through a quiet uh, village. So of course, uh, we have some ideas that this the noise barrier can also be equipped by solar panels. So it's, it creates sustainable energy at the same time. But uh, the response from the inhabitants was the first time was a bit unexpected because they, they thought, well, we don't like something that separate us. Can we make more transparent? Of course, transparent uh, so, uh, sound barrier will cost more than the, the traditional solution. So then it pushed the universities, students and professors like 
to think of a new type of solar panels, which we developed together with some companies. And then we apply this and we, we fit it into this, uh, this local planning uh, framework, which finally worked. So, and then we scaled up the approach to the other locations. Probably this is a, a very practical way uh, to show how the quadruple helix can work. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Riza, for the very insightful uh, answer. Okay, we go move forward uh, very quickly now to uh, Vidyani. Uh, I will ask about, um, well, previously Sat mentioned about inclusivity in the process of placemaking and how do you think this inclusivity variable will be implemented in the planning of the new capital city, uh, IKN, Nusantara? Thank you, Rosalind. It's an interesting question. Yeah, uh, it's quite complicated because uh, I think the methods of placemaking normally are applied after there are already residents who utilize, who utilize the space exist. And now for Ika and there will for a new capital, there are no one stay there because we move people from Jakarta to the new capital. So perhaps I think we can have at least two tactics. To begin, we can, during the planning strategy, uh, we can do study with the, to, uh, to anticipate it users who will be relocated to the place, to the new capital city, I mean. And we can also ask them to construct not just facilities, but also events and teach them, teach some of them to become a placemakers to do the placemaking after they move. This is the preparation. And then I think second, we can also have... Uh, if there are already some residents in the new capital city, we can begin to implement the placemaking strategy as a participatory design, as uh, Lisette uh, already mentioned. I think that's my uh, answers. Thank you. Thank you, Mavidiani. Okay, we're moving forward quite quickly uh, to Lisette and... Yeah, this is uh, maybe quite interesting for the audience because this is a best practice uh, from the Netherlands. So, so from your experience and knowledge, I understand that placemakers place need support from uh, stakeholders. Could you please tell us more how it was with the creations of Almero City as an example of newly, of course, it's not um, completely new, but compared to other cities in the Netherlands, <coughs> it's quite new. Yeah, example of uh, from Almero City uh, and uh, how it is compared with the other city in the Netherlands. Thank, thank you, Rosalind. It's a difficult question. Um, okay. Almere, uh, I wouldn't say it's best practice, but uh, okay. in a sense, it, it, it will help me to, 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 to build on uh, Widiani's uh, answer, actually. So Almere is one of the new towns, right? In the Netherlands, it was uh, really top-down planned uh, about 60, 70 years ago, really out of a necessity, which of course is now also happening in Indonesia. Um, very small scale though, uh, but on a completely bare, bare ground. So um, uh, reclaimed from the sea, a polder as we, as we uh, call it, and um, yeah, very top-down planning. So I remember when I was in college, uh, I was seeing seeing these pictures of, of, you know, housewives moving with their suitcases to this completely new build city. There was nothing there. There's sand and some beautiful houses, and that's it. So there was no idea of of building community around that place. No, no idea. Um, you know, I was I, I was a baby then, so uh, I was not even born, I, I guess. But um, um, seeing these pictures is, is, is quite alien, right? So this is something that you as as uh, uh, you don't want, basically. Um, and although you know 
there's going to be a new capital, there is something there already, right? It's not bare ground. It's not the moon. It's not, it's not Mars. There's something there already. There are people there already. So I think, it, uh, as, as Dr. Bidiani also mentioned, um, use, for one, use what is there already to understand the sense of place that is there. Um, and try, we call it, make a soft map. Um, and of course, it's going to be a huge area. But try to see which of these, these, these places are very important to be kept. Uh, to be able to build a sense of place around it. As I mentioned, right, we need to, to start with life, then with place, and then the buildings around it. So even in a new, new to be developed uh, area, um, there is a uniqueness about that, that, that place that you can try to capture. Then use the 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 people that that yeah supposedly are going to 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 move there. Uh, quite a few will be known already, and use them in a very very early stages to uh, to uh, learn to understand what they need to uh, to build those communities. And per perhaps it's not you know making houses everywhere making uh, buildings everywhere but tr had try to 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 move communities rather than than yeah to let it be all open but it's a it's a massive task so uh um yeah um super interesting <clears throat> Indeed, we are also looking forward for the designs of the new capital. Thank you, Lisette, for your mm. answer. And uh, the question to Paul, Peter Paul. Okay, um, the goal of creating smart city is to benefit the people who reside there. On the contrary, don't you believe that smart city create discriminatory concern for individuals who cannot follow the advanced technology because you're talking about the tools and it's, uh, you're collecting data from people means that people need to be uh, literate. In the case of Indonesia, many has access to internet, but perhaps quite illiterate in supplying a uh, good quality of data to the platform that uh, the tools that you and, 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 in, and, and the organization has developed. So how do you see that? Well, this, this is a very good point, I think. And also uh, in my presentation, I also pointed out already that uh, new technology as, a, as a clearly also the potential to, to exclude groups. And uh, I think they certainly think there is a, is a big concern about uh, the new technologies that are that are based on, uh, on uh, that are based on smart, smart city oriented, uh, using uh, internet as an access portal, that there is ex uh, that certain groups will be excluded. Uh, I think that that's a certainly a point, point of concern. Uh, looking at the new new mobility solutions that we have seen in cities, we've seen we've seen clearly seen that uh, there is a there is the the, the risk that uh, public uh, uh, values will will be exploited by private companies, and uh, I think there there uh, also municipalities play an important role. I think there's there's a need for uh, to for them to to learn, uh, maybe to experiment, but in the end also to regulate. And, and that, that also, coming back to your question about the, the, the access to, 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 to data, um, and that also is, it should be part of, part of this discussion. Okay, so thank you, Peter Paul. So we are really approaching to the end of this session, and I will uh, conclude, uh, uh, I will try to finish this with asking you, each of you, of the speaker to give a one minute uh, closing statement with this to these questions how existing technology can be employed for re-establishing the connection between city and citizens one minute closing statement in regard to that question and it will start with Rizal please well I think uh, I mentioned a few times during my presentation the digitalization is in, is an enabler and Peter Paul mentioned just now as about data collection. I think it's not only uh, uh, from the citizens, but the municipalities, the local governments uh, can contribute and should contribute in uh, uh, reliable data. So I think that's the way how digitalization will assist our goal. Thank you.
Thank you, Riza. And go on to uh, Vidyani, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, in my case, we, uh, I, I, the students start to do the digital placemaking. It's not a. Uh, it's it it is a real place making, but uh, by the by the use of app, uh, we try to uh, connect people with the technology. For example, how uh, chairs can uh, create a conversation, uh, can create a eagerness to con uh, to do the conversation to the person next to you. For example, so this is uh, how we we try to do uh, as a digital placemaking. And thank you very what... much. Uh, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mavidi. And uh, Lisat, what is your answer there? Well, <clears throat> I would say, uh, you know, uh, as mentioned already quite a few times during these, uh, this, uh, this panel, uh, we are the city, right? Um, so I would urge everybody to take ownership and take responsibility and not lean back and wait for others, you know, the local authorities, the real estate developers, but also the universities, like wait for others to, to, to step in and, and do it for you. No, we are all placemakers, uh, even within this super complex uh, uh, situation. Um, but I think we can all uh, do our best to do something that feels good for us. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Lisette. And lastly, uh, Peter Paul, please. Yes, it's, it's, uh, technologies, of course, can, 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 can be a blessing, but it's also uh, sometimes uh, it's really, really hard to manage. But it, we have to be aware of that, I think. That, that, that is so that we, of course, it's uh, interesting to see all kinds of electric vehicles coming up in cities, and we, that, that's a blessing. We, we should be aware of all the, that there is also a downside to it. I think that in the in in how how these these new new technologies are are in, um, applied in cities, there should be it should be awareness that there should be attention for inclusivity, for also equality, and livability, and uh, that yeah. it is not not something that will, will come by its own. We you need to have yeah. it needs attention and it needs. You need to be diligent also. Start start experimenting, make connection, and then uh, yeah, I think that's also the way to 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 to, look, to show to people how technology also is to their benefit and include yeah. the, the people. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for all uh, your insightful knowledge sharing for today. Uh, at this season, we are really exceeding the time that we are allowed to. I'm sorry to the organization, but this is really fruitful. This is a really fruitful uh, session uh, for us all, uh, hopefully also for, uh, for the audience. And thank you, Results Bastian. Thank you, Vidiani. Thank you, Lisaat van Rijk. Uh, thank you, Peter Tov van der Trains, and also the audience uh, who uh, are attending this session. And if you have still questions or would like to collaborate uh, further, uh, feel free. Feel free to contact the organization. Uh, feel free to contact the organization Nufik Neso and VO Brint because they have all the contact uh, of, of all the speakers right now. I wish you all have a nice day uh, in the Netherlands and also have a nice evening in Indonesia. And hopefully we will see you again on the next uh, winner uh, next year in this kind of uh, topic. Thank you. Bye all. <laughs>